So I'd like to thank uh, Park Systems for the invitation and for the organization. I'll be talking about a device that can dynamically reconfigure. So these are devices based on 2D transition metal dichalcogenized or, or in general Van der Waals materials. And I'm going to motivate my talk by talking about how they can be used to enable more efficient computing devices by enabling uh, reconfigurable logic and enabling uh, machine learning applications. Uh, so if you're new here, I encourage you to take a tour. Uh, uh, one of our, uh, the strengths of the college is this fabrication facility, so this is just behind us. Uh, I'm an active user of this facility. My graduate students uh, get trained to use this, and the devices that I'll be talking about are based on this, uh, the, uh, the devices we fabricated right here. Uh, before continuing, let me briefly talk about some of the things we do in, in our group. We're interested in a lot of different things. Uh, so for a non-biologist like me, I think of DNA as just a semiconductor. So it's kind of a lattice and a basis. So here we're trying to measure the conductivity of a lambda DNA. And these are two electrodes that we, uh, we contacted. And so what specifically what we're trying to do is understand the transport of not just electrons, but of holes. So in molecular biology, holes are not really discussed much. And we're trying to make a PN junction along a DNA to study the transport property of holes. Uh, over here, we uh, fabricated a penetrating neuroprobe using our facility. Uh, uh, I have a completely useless patent on, on this. This is a carbon nanotube. These are gates underneath. Uh, these are used to fabricate a PN junction diode. So a lot of these nanostructure materials uh, don't have dopants, like dopants that we're familiar with uh, in silicon bulk technology. So we use gates to uh, dope, and we can form a PN junction along a single uh, nanotube and we use it to study uh, excitonic properties, many body effects, trying to measure the band gap, and so forth. Working with biologists, we cultured a cancer cell with this device. So cancer cells uh, proliferate, they also adhere to the substrate, and they like to migrate into these trenches. So we have a situation where the nanotube is threading a single cell, and we're trying to develop a single cell in vivo sensor using a carbon nanotube. With the nanotube, uh, if we uh, strike electron beam, uh, so we put the device in an SEM, we scan an electron beam across it, the electron beam excites plasmons, and the plasmonic signal is directly related to the intensity of the beam. And what we do is we actually rotate the nanotube uh, with respect to the beam, and we can do a tomographic reconstruction of the electron beam intensity profile. Uh, so moving on here, we're also interested in, uh, in modeling and, and doing uh, metrology. So this is a finite element modeling of a carbon nan uh, graphene PN device under a small magnetic field. And when we inject electrons, the electrons will rotate under the influence of a magnetic field. And as they cross the PN junction, the electron actually turns into a hole, and the hole will curve the other way. So we do these kind of modeling to correlate with our experimental studies. Uh, we also have a, a nanoprober inside an SCM, and we're using this to develop metrology techniques for quantum transport studies. Uh, so using this tool, we, we analyze the, the spatial intensity profile of an electron beam. So today I'm going to talk about uh, this quadrant where we uh, look at studies of van der Waal materials like graphene and, and transition metal dichalcogenides, and how we can enable a more efficient uh, computing devices. So specifically, I'll be talking about this device. Uh, so let me motivate my talk by talking about machine learning um, algorithms. So whether you're looking at convolution neural network, uh, which is an algorithm used for um, image uh, recognition or LSTM for speech recognition, a lot of these uh, algorithms weren't, weren't anticipated when general purpose computing uh, evolved. So von Neumann architecture where CPU and memory are not co-located didn't anticipate the use of these applications which require a lot of memory. Uh, so because memory is now co-located with CPU, accessing memory, writing memory, uh, takes up enormous amount of energy and, and access time. Uh, so this is what's known as bottleneck. So one of the things we're, we're trying to do is, is develop 3D monolithic integration. So as you know, Moore's law uh, increases functionality by shrinking the transistor and increasing the transistor density by packing more transistors. Another way of realizing Moore's law is by stacking the transistors vertically. 
And so if you could stack transistors vertically, you don't have to rely completely on scaling alone to increase functionality. In addition to that, if you embed memory, so in this paper study, uh, so this is a, uh, a graph that I work with uh, colleagues for a proposal. What we're doing is we're all, we, all, we alternate between memory and logic. So if you can uh, stack memory and logic vertically, you can increase the read bandwidth tremendously at power. So without any additional uh, power, uh, for example, we can achieve 64 terabytes of read bandwidth at power. Uh, and this is enabled because we reduce the parasitics and we're co-locating the memory and logic. So this is one of the motivations for looking at 2D materials. Another motivation is that the 2D materials can enable, enable a device that can dynamically reconfigure. So I talked about CNN. So CNN is computationally very expensive. Uh, an approximation to CNN is XNORNet. So XNORNet is, is kind of all the rage. Uh, XNORNet can implement similar accuracy to CNN, but with much reduced power and, and memory. Uh, now, to implement an XNOR logic using CMOS is very costly. It takes, uh, it takes over tw a dozen transistors to implement an XNOR logic. So here we have a layout of a four transistor, a very compact XOR logic using a device that can dynamically reconfigure. And this is enabled by, uh, by two, these 2D materials like transition metal dicalcogenides. Uh, so in, in implementing 3D monolithic integration, so for example, the first layer logic, this is going to be done in CMOS. Uh, companies, and, and maybe Nate and Katie will talk about this later, so embedded memory, a non-volatile memory, is being uh, researched, and, and this will happen. Trying to do this layer is very difficult. You can't put a silicon on top of this structure and make a silicon-based CMOS logic because you will run out of uh, thermal budget so to do this, you need an alternative semiconductor, and this is where we're trying to integrate 2D materials in our fab to allow this second level logic. So these are some of the motivations for looking at um, a uh, 2D material, and I'm going to specifically talk about one of these devices, a transistor that can dynamically reconfigure to implement a very compact X uh, null logic. But I'm going to be even more, I'm going to talk about a device that is even more versatile. So I'm going to talk about a single device that, in, that can implement the three most fundamental devices in semiconductor technology. So if you open up a, a textbook in semiconductor physics, uh, you're going to learn about the PN diode. Uh, you may then learn about the bipolar junction transistor, and then the, the MOSFET, the fundamental unit of our CPU, you, you, know, you may learn about that. So I'm going to uh, teach you or explain to you a semester's worth of <laughs> device physics uh, in about 20 minutes, all based on one device that can dynamically implement all these functions. Uh, so this is too much detail, but I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail. So in addition to a PN diode, um, MOSFET, and BJT, we can also change the polarity of the device. So if you have a PN, you can also realize an MP. Uh, for MOSFET, there, right, there are two types. You have a P-channel conducting device and an N-channel conducting device. So this single device can do both. And then I'm going to talk about the two different types of bipolar junction transistors, an NPN transistor and a PNP transistor. Uh, device looks like this. So uh, it uses gates. Uh, so we don't use dopants, but we use gates to dope. Uh, so here we have three gates. And then we have three contacts onto this 2D semiconductor. And the 2D semiconductor can be any version, uh, MOS2, tungsten desalinide. These are layer materials. Some of these studies, we use exfoliation, but we're also now trying to scale it up and use a large area uh, CVD-grown uh, 2D materials integrated into our, into our line. Uh, so we, we, uh, the base structure comes from the fab, and then we either exfoliate or transfer these 2D materials onto our base structure. Uh, so again, this, is a, this was a device that, was, that we use exfoliate, that we use exfoliation techniques. So here's the flake. These are the two gates, the two end gates. There's a third gate in the middle, but in the optical image, you can't see it because there, it's, it's so narrow. Uh, here's an SCM image of the, the middle region. So you have the false color image of the source and the base. I'm not showing the drain. And in the faint image, 
in the gray, that's the Berry Gates. There's, those are the three Berry Gates that you see over here. And this is just a TM image of what the our cross section looks like. So we have these gates, uh, we have a dielectric, on top of it we lay our 2D materials and then we contact it. Okay, uh, so uh, this uh, uh, symposium is, is about SPM, so let me describe how an SPM could help our study. So I'm gonna take a, a little detour and talk about what we did to analyze a graphene PN junction. So here's an AFM image of a, an exfoliated graphene. This is a, some of the very earliest studies uh, that we did on graphene. Uh, so that's a monolayer. Underneath that monolayer are the, the Berry gates. But of course, in a topographical image, you can't see it. And you can't see it because we used our 300 millimeter line to polish the surface. So, so the Berry gates are there, but you can't see it in the topographical image. Now, uh, what I'm gonna do is now turn this image uh, 45 degrees, and we're gonna apply uh, voltage on the gates, and we're gonna do a potential, a surface potential imaging of that graphene. So when gates are both zero, you have a fairly uniform potential on the graphene. And then when you uh, apply uh, plus and minus 10 volts, we form a PN junction or an NP junction this way, and you can see a nice built-in voltage, and we use the built-in voltage to do fundamental studies like measuring the density of states, where the Fermi energy is, and, and so forth. And because dopant isn't fixed, we can change the polarity of the diode. So here we switch the bias to minus 10 and plus 10, and we can realize now a, a PN junction diode. So these are the kind of studies we, we want to perform in, in, in our, our uh, semiconducting devices. Uh, we're in the process of doing it. We haven't, I don't have any data to show yet. Uh, let me now uh, go back to our uh, reconfigurable device. Um, so one of the first things we need to realize is an, is an ambipolar conduction. So we have these three gates, we bias it all together, uh, and we look at the, what's called the transfer curve across the, the channel material. So with all three gates biased together, we want to see a, a hole conduction when the gate is sufficiently negative, and an electron conduction when the, and when the gates are sufficiently positive. So once we've established ambipolar conduction, then we can reconfigure and form any device that we want. Uh, so in this case, uh, so the color code represents the bias in the three gates to realize an NPP junction. And we're going to look at the PN diode this way. And uh, we can see that the IV curve shows rectification. And when we switch the, the bias and then the polarity, we realize an NPP. And NPP shows the opposite rectification behavior. So this is exactly what we want to see. So we don't always look at things on a linear, linear scale. We want to look at things more, in more detail. So we plot the current on a log linear scale. And you can see that the two uh, IV characteristics show a nice rectification. Uh, the lines are fit to the uh, a dial model. And the important parameter is this ideality factor. So the devices we're currently making are not ideal. We are in the process of making more ideal devices. But the devices we made back then were not ideal. And so these diodes are characterized by an ideality factor that is greater than two. So they're, they tend to be around two. Um, so we looked at the diode this way, but we can also look at the, uh, the uh, a diode between the source and the, what, what I'm calling the base contact, or the drain and the base contact. And these are the IV characters that we can realize. Uh, and then we can also uh, shine light, and so these are uh, these operate as photovoltaic devices. So here's looking at the IV characteristics, again, on a, on a log linear scale. But because dopant is, isn't fixed, we can change one of the dopants. So here we're changing, uh, let's say, the dopant on the left contact. And we can see that how the, the open circuit voltage, so the open circuit voltage is around half a volt. And we can see how the open circuit voltage changes as we vary one of the dopants. Uh, we can also do spectroscopy. Uh, so Looking at the photocurrent as a function of the energy of the photon we, we shine, we, we excite. Uh, we're looking at where the optical transitions occur, where the band gap is, and excitonic transitions, and so forth. Uh, let me move on to uh, the other device. So uh, this is an image from Lucent. So the very first transistor uh, is, what's, is what's called a, a point contact transistor. It's very much like a bipolar junction transistor. And, uh, uh, and, and that's what it looks like. 
I kind of liken what we're doing to, to that. Our, our device is kind of kludgy, but, and, but we're still in the very early stage of developing some of these devices. Uh, so uh, a lot of people know about MOSFETs. Very few people know about bipolar junction transistors, even though that was the dominant transistor. Uh, people made CPUs until MOSFET came along. I'm going to spend some time describing about the BJT. So a BJT is nothing but a back-to-back a -back, uh, PN dial. Uh, so we have one junction here, another junction here, and there are three contacts to each of these uh, dope regions. Uh, typically, it's called an emitter, base, and drain, but because our device actually operates like a MOSFET too, I'm calling this the source and the drain instead of calling an emitter and a, and a collector. Uh, so in a bipolar transition transistor, you forward bias one diode and reverse bias the other diode. So in this case, we're going to forward bias this diode. So electrons are being, are being injected, and then um, and the holes are being injected the other way. Uh, this current is completely useless. So you, you want to minimize the holes that are being, in, being injected into the, uh, the source region. So what you do is you, you uh, reduce the doping of the base. So we want the base doping to be as low as possible. You want to maximize the injection of electrons, so you make the emitter doping or the source doping as large as possible. So it's an M plus P minus uh, junction. Uh, this junction, we're going to reverse bias it because we want to collect as many of the electrons that are being injected into the base. Uh, so there's some, some nominal doping in the base. Uh, in the process of uh, injecting the electrons, as the electrons cross the base, some of them will recombine, and that will give rise to this base current. So the figure merit for this device is how many electrons you collect for how many holes you, you inject. So the ratio of the drain to base current is the most important figure merit that represents gain, and you want the gain to be as large as possible. Uh, so let's look at our, uh, so this is, I think, the very first BJT in, in these 2D systems. So let's look at a, uh, a BJT that we dope similar to what I just described. Uh, so there are three contacts, but let me first ground the source and the base. Uh, so this should behave like a diode, and indeed the IV characteristics exhibit a diode behavior, and we're looking at the current at all three terminals. Uh, so let's look at the, uh, the base current. So here's the base current. So when VD uh, is positive, I'm reverse biasing the second junction, and this is just a leakage current. Um, and so here's the leakage current, and you can already see that the device is exhi exhibiting gain. Uh, so most of the current flows between the drain and the source. Uh, so here's the reverse bias, here's the forward bias characteristics, and very little current is flowing through the base. So there's already indication that there's a large gain in this device. Now, uh, something very different happens when I forward bias this junction. So let me apply uh, minus volt. So minus volt to the source for bias this first junction. And let's look at the base currents. So before, when it was grounded, the base, all the IV curves behave like a diode. And when I apply, when I four bias this junction, I see that the base current doesn't have this dip anymore. It's not changing sign. And so we're already entering a different regime of transport. And this base current arises because of the recombination of of the holes with the injection, injecting electrons. Uh, so as you can see, most of the current flows between, again, the drain and the source, and that's exactly what you want. And this base current flows because of the recombination current. And this will just continue. So if I increase the source current, I forward bias the first junction even, even more. I increase the overall current. And again, here's the base current. The base current does not change sign. And that's because there is a steady state recombination current. And you can see uh, that the gain is large. Gain is basically the ratio of the drain current to the base current. Uh, so this is uh, typically plotted in, in what is known as the gamma plot. Um, so you're plotting, uh, so whether you use a common base or common emitter configuration, you're looking at the base current and the drain current. That ratio is the gain. Um, and you look at it in terms of uh, the four bias voltage. So already, you know, these devices have, have gain, and, and they're quite large. So here's kind of the, w another way of looking at it. So beta is this uh, figure of merit. That's the, the gain parameter. Uh, 
uh, we're looking at as a function of the four bias, and we're going to vary the doping in the base. So as a function of four bias for a given VG2, the gain doesn't really change much. But as we decrease, in absolute sense, the, the doping in the, in the base, you see this dramatic increase in the gain. Uh, so that's kind of summarized in here. So we're seeing a gain that is approaching 1,000. In some of our devices, we have a gain of 10,000. So just as a reference, uh, if you look at most bulk semiconducting devices, like silicon, the gain is, is a lot less than 100. Uh, if you look at some hetero, uh, hetero devices, the gain might be a few hundred. Uh, so in this device, we've achieved this very large gain. And, and one of the reasons for that is because as we uh, change the doping, we're actually also changing the width of the base. Uh, so this is not possible with uh, bulk because doping is fixed. But in our device, we can dynamically change the doping. And in the process, we're also changing the width of the base. So we did uh, some numerical simulations. We actually you know, we, 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 uh, can estimate how much of the base region is doped. And we can actually estimate how the width of the base actually changes um, with, with bias. Uh, so here's just a, a more detailed plot. So dopant as a function of um, this spacing for different gate bias. And you can see that the, the base actually decreases. So the important parameter is the, the so the gain is determined by the transit time of the uh, carriers. And uh, it also depends on the recombination time. So both the transit time decreases uh, because um, the width, is, the width of the base is actually shrinking. And the recombination of the minority care is also uh, improving because the dopant is, is also changing. Uh, we can also operate this device as a, as a phototransistor. Uh, so instead of actually modulating the base electro, the base bias uh, externally, you can, you can float that and use light instead to modulate uh, the base potential. Uh, so here are some IV characteristics under a phototransistor mode. Here are the IV characteristics for a, for a comparable PN diode. So if you look at the IV characteristics, again, looking at the log scale, as we increase the intensity of light, we see that the, the diode exhibits photovoltaic effect, where the dip represents the open circuit voltage. Uh, so in a phototransistor, um, uh, we don't see an open circuit voltage because we have two back-to-back -back diodes. And the photocurrent in the back-to-back -back diode actually cancel. So, um, so you don't expect to see uh, 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 an open circuit voltage like you see in a photodiode. And we can uh, sweep the IV characters under different illumination. And the uh, important parameter here, like the BJT, is the is the ratio of the currents. In this case, it's the ratio of the current that you realize on the phototransistor mode and the ratio of the photocurrent that you realize in a PN diode mode. So that the ratio gives you a photocurrent gain. So you see gain in this device. Um, here's another way of looking at it. So the red curve represents the photodiode. And you can see a, a well-defined open circuit voltage. Uh, you don't see an open circuit voltage when you operate the device as a phototransistor. Uh, and the difference or the ratio of the, of, of the current, photocurrent on the phototransistor to the diode represents gain. So you can see exactly where, the, where you see gain. So the, the region where the current in the phototransistor is above that of the photodiode represents the biased region where you see gain. And so we're seeing uh, uh, the gain is not as high, and, and I won't have time to go into the detail, but so we have a, a photocurrent gain of about 40 in our device. Uh, last but not least, I'm going to talk about this reconfigurable device. This is the device that's needed to implement a very efficient XNOR logic. So it's a single device that can function as a P-channel or an N-channel FAT, depending on the bias you apply on the gates. Uh, so to make a, a P-channel device, we, we dope the two ends P+. Plus. We use the middle gate just as a, as a regular transistor uh, so for, so a function, as a function of different VD. We see these uh, nice on-off characteristics. Um, now, uh, by just switching the end gates, the bias on the end, to 2.5 volts, we can realize an N-channel FET. And here are the N-channel characteristics. Uh, 
So as a function of VD, the, the on current increases, the, this is the sub, sub threshold region of the transistor. You don't want that to vary as a function of a drain bias, and we see very low drain induced barrier lowering. Um, that's because our dielectric is, is, is scale for the transistor. Uh, only problem is that the n-channel fat current is less than the p-channel fat, and that's because we form shocky contacts, and the uh, shocky contact for the n-channel is uh, not as transmissive. So we are in the process of looking at this. In fact, we have realized a fully tunable shocky contact where the shocky contact is, is completely uh, transparent to electron and holes. Um, so, the, so these are some of the latest developments that we're doing in our lab. I won't go into the details. So PN dial, MOSFET, and a BGT, each device has its own figure of merit. Um, so, uh, so for example, MOSFET, and the MOSFET is the slope of that uh, subthreshold sub region. You can uh, measure that and then correlate that to the interface density of states. Using the interface density of states, we can use that to calculate the uh, generation current that leads to the leakage current of the PN diode. So we use this parameter, calculate um, the generation rate, which, which gives you a tau. This is the lifetime of the minority carrier. And then using that tau, you can also use that to calculate the figure merit of the bipolar junction transistor. So the gain you can also represent in terms of the ratio of the transit time to the lifetime. So using that tau, we can actually also um, calculate the figure of merit for the BGT. So using a single parameter, the interface sensor states, you can understand all three devices. Uh, so let me just conclude. Uh, so we made this reconfigurable dice. It's a, it's a nice study. We are using it for machine learning applications to enable more efficient computing devices. So the, uh, so the compact XNO logic should uh, enable more en energy efficient computing uh, implementing that in a 3D monolithic fashion will not only address beyond more applications, but also lead to more efficient machine learning applications. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude and maybe take questions. Too much device physics in, in one sitting. Yeah. You mentioned that you had shocky contacts. Yep. Right. Than the right. And I was wondering um, how you determine you know, how much of your transistor action you Right. So there's a, so uh, our device is kind of unique because we can actually use dope source strain contacts. So, so we use the two N gates to now make, let's say, P plus contacts. So they do have some resistance, but if I modulate the middle gate, I'm not modulating the Schalke contacts, I'm only modulating the channel. And so this is a true representation of what a p-channel fat will behave like. Uh, now the on current is still limited by the shocky contacts. And so we're addressing that by making, so here we made a metal to direct semiconductor shocky contact. If you could engineer the contact to be a graphene. So if you use graphene to contact a 2D, those are two van der Waals materials. In principle, you should have no interface states. And, and we've demonstrated that you can make a completely um, a tunable shocky contact where that barrier completely goes away. And so you can do that for both a, a p-channel contact and for the n-channel contact. Yes? When you mentioned you use graphing or PMDC material, you exfoliated, right? Right, so these studies were based on exfoliation. Right, but right. I was wondering, have you done any study like uh, is the graphene single crystal or polycrystal? Uh, is there any grain boundary in the PMDC? Because a lot of time PMDC is grown on single crystal sapphire. Right. And there is a lot of grain boundary because yeah. the lack is uh, of the uh, PMDC may not match the uh, substrate. Right, so right. Lots, lots of defects. Yeah. So those, this yeah, yeah. How would that affect the yeah, so, so there's some uh, work that I haven't shown. So we've also looked at large area graphene. Uh, 
uh, we looked at transport through the large area graphene, and that graphene was using a, uh, was synthesized using a CVD technique, and we've also transferred that graphene into our 300 millimeter line. Uh, so if you look at that graphene, the mobility is still very very high. It's not high as uh, an, ex an exfoliated graphene that you, you uh, sandwich between other exfoliated materials like hexagonal boronite type. So, uh, so a lot of these applications, I don't think you need super high mobility uh, graphene. Uh, the graphene still needs to be clean, and we also have evidence that those CVD graphene can make a tunable shock heat contact. So we have that demonstration, that graphene grown using a CVD technique, if you transfer it to a semiconductor, that forms a tunable shocky contact. Uh, in terms of now the, uh, the semiconductor itself, so uh, we primarily looked at exfoliated graphene, but others have looked at large area um, synthesized CVD graphene, and the mobility is actually comparable to uh, maybe not as FinFET, which is the leading, leading edge transistor, but the mobility is comparable to, let's say, a 65 nanometer node. So 65 nanometer node is about a 10-year-old technology. Uh, so to implement 3D monolithic integration, you don't need you know, the second, fifth layers to be a FinFET. Even if you have a 65 nanometer node mobility, that's good enough. In fact, if you just stack 65 nanometer node transistors, you can get uh, a functionality that's equivalent to a seven nanometer node technology. Did I, did I answer your question? Yeah. So, I mean, so we're looking at, you know, large area transistors. These are one or three micron long transistors uh, synthesized using CVD techniques. And the mobility is already there. It's already high enough that you can make, uh, you know, very efficient computing, computing devices. Yes? So, uh, so it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, graphene requires high temperature. So it is unlikely that you're going to take a 300 millimeter uh, CMOS device, cook, cook it to 1,000 degrees C, and grow graphene. You can um, synthesize graphene at a lower temperature, but the quality is not as good. Uh, now, with 2D materials, I think the temperature is at a borderline. You, you might be able to take a 300 millimeter wafer and take it to a temperature that will allow the growth of 2D materials. Um, and so in that sense, it will be more compatible. Right, right. Uh, it, because we use gates. Uh, so Right, these 2D materials, they really aren't dopants. Uh, similar with graphene, there aren't any dopants, uh, carbon nanotubes. So in, in fact, with, if you look at nanostructure materials, you actually don't want a substitutional doping. You don't want to take a, let's say, a carbon atom from a graphene and replace it with another atom. That will most likely destroy the, your lattice structure. It will destroy, it will perturb the electronic structure sufficiently that you're going to impact the quality of the material. So, so instead, what we do is, so go back, sorry. We use gates. So these are gates. Uh, so it's, instead of having a top gate, we have bottom gates. It's just more efficient to fabricate that way. We put a dielectric. Uh, these gates can be biased independently. And then we can then put whatever we want on top. We can put DNA, carbon nanotube, graphene, you name it. We can put it over there uh, and then uh, use and then make contacts. And then uh, we can use, let's say, plus 10 volts, minus 10 volts to create a field-induced modulation of the Fermi level. So it, the device is more complex, but we have also worked with computer architectures. So Individual device is more complex, but if you scale it, if you, let's say, make a 64-bit adder, uh, because of the compactness of our device, overall there's an energy saving. So if you look at uh, energy delay product of a scale device, there is at least a tenfold increase 
in uh, energy efficiency. All right, thank you very much. All right.